Certainly. Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Peter Ku, and I'm the Chair of the Committee on Technology. I want to welcome you all to today's hearing, which will, be, which will focus on getting an update on the progress of the Automated Decision Systems Task Force created by Local Law 49 of 2018. The adoption of new technologies offer us significant benefits that can vastly improve people's everyday lives. They allow us to communicate easier and enable us to operate more efficiently. However, as these technologies advance, we must acknowledge that if left unchecked, they can have negative consequences. In today's connected world, people produce massive amounts of data while going on their everyday lives and when accessing government services. This data is fundamental to cities' operations. Many agencies deploy advanced data analytics and algorithms and make use of this data and to make decisions. Increasingly, algorithm, um, no, increasingly algorithmic tools are utilized throughout city agencies in order to evaluate communities and, and individuals and are used to determine where services go and how penalties are set. In October 2017, my predecessor, Council Member Walker, used the example of education. How does the city determine what school a student can attend? While well, it's undeniable that these tools help city agencies operate more effectively and offer residents more targeted, impacted services. Algorithms are not without issues. There is a common assumption that automated decision systems automatically result in unbiased decisions. However, there have been studies that detail situations in which algorithms produce biased outcomes. In addition, algorithms remain hidden from the public view, making it unclear when and why agencies use algorithms. When agencies do use algorithms, it's often unclear the assumptions they are based upon, what data they even consider, and how that data is weighted. These tools are often developed by private developers who do not dis disclose their predictive models or algorithms, nor do they publish the source code for their software, leaving little transparency with the public. Local Law 49 was enacted by the city to establish a task force that is required to provide recommendations on how information on agency automated decision systems may be shared with the public and how agencies may address instances where people are harmed by agency automated decision systems. Local Law 49 also requires the task force to ensure to issue a report 18 months after the estab establishment of the task force and its members are charged with recommending procedures for reviewing and assessing uh, the city's automated decision systems to ensure equity and fairness. This legislation was the first in the country and it's important that New York City continues to be a leader and serve as a model for other jurisdictions who are pursuing uh, this issue. Therefore, the committee looks forward to testimony from the administration and advocates to discuss compliance with Local Law 49, ensuring governmental transparency in automated decision systems and to understand 
the challenges faced by ADS task force to review whether algorithms used by city agencies are fair and just. I look forward to hearing from the panels today, and I'd like to thank the technology staff, Patrick Mulhill, Sebastian Bachi, Ivy Bajoski, and my own staff, Elaine Chong, for putting uh, together this hearing. I would like to recognize the technology committee members, Council Members Holden and Council Member Irving. So uh, now we will begin the public hearing, and we have panel uh, one, uh, Kelly Jean, Brittany Saunders, and Jeff T, right? Yeah. So you can identify, or oh no, you have to be swearing by the council, yeah. So do you, do you affirm to tell the truth, the only truth, and answer honest, honestly to council members' questions today? Yeah. Thank you. So please identify yourself and start, yeah. Um, thank you, council member Ku and, and the committees on technology. Um, my name is Jeff Tomkitigasem. I'm the director for the mayor's office of uh, operations and chair of the Automated Decision uh, Systems Task Force. I'm joined by my fellow Kel uh, co-chairs, Kelly Jin, the city's chief analytics officer and director of the mayor's office of data analytics, as well as Brittany Saunders, who's deputy commissioner for strategic initiatives at the uh, New York City Commission on Human Rights. We're here today to testify about the task force's work to date and our upcoming work and engagements. Uh, I'll start with some background, um, some of which has been touched upon by council member Ku, but um, some background and basics about the task force. Uh, as you know, the Automated Decision Task Force, the ADS Task Force, uh, was established by local law, uh, 49 of 2018, uh, sponsored by then Council Member Vaca. Um, as noted, to our knowledge, the city's ADS Task Force is the first of its kind in the country uh, for local government. This law mandates the task force to issue recommendations specifically related to the following. A process for publicly disclosing information about agency ADS where appropriate, uh, a procedure for individuals to request and receive information about decisions affecting them that are made uh, using an ADS, as well as a procedure for the city to determine any disproportionate impact based upon an individual's protected status and for any ad addressing any instances of harm under such circumstances. Um, recommendations on criteria for identifying which agency ADS systems should be subject to one or more of the above procedures and a feasibility analysis uh, for archiving agency systems and the associated data. As you know, uh, the task force's mandate is a new frontier for city government, and, then one, and one that we are very thankful uh, to have the opportunity to lead. Uh, our recommendations will spur continued important conversations surrounding the complex fields of ADS, and we do really want to emphasize how much not just we as the chairman uh, of the task force, but all the task force members take this seriously and are, are thankful for the opportunity. Local governments have always made decisions based on information and data, but today governments increasingly rely on data and technology to improve the way they deliver services to and engage with residents. Automated decision systems are instruments that can help improve fairness, uh, streamline workflows, and increase data-driven decision making. Um, they have the opportunity to um, increase accountability and transparency. These positive outcomes of using ADS are why they are becoming more prevalent in government. They can help better connect New Yorkers with city programs, improve social deliver, uh, special service delivery, and in some cases can help make decisions fair and more equitable. However, we also know that unfortunately, ADS also have the potential to perpetuate bias and disproportionately impact certain people or populations. We applaud our partners on the Citadel Council for bringing attention to ADS through the creation of this task force and for making space for the important and challenging discussions around the development and use of tools, of ADS tools, in city decision making. One of the goals of the task force recommendations will provide much needed clarity to city agencies and the public about the nature, purpose, and management of ADS in the local New York City government context. As part of our mandate, we strive to develop clear recommendations that allow for continued research, dialogue, and encourage ongoing insight and comment from the public and advocates. <clears throat> now, I'd like to take a moment to discuss the work the task force itself is undertaking. The Mayor's Office of Operations, the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, and the City Commission on Human Rights all serve as co-chairs of this task force. 
And I think it's important to note because it reflects our dedication to bring different and balanced perspectives, project management, and, and analysis to all of the work ahead, not just within this task force timeframe, but moving forward. The task force also has 18 additional members, 12 of whom work outside of city government and have rich backgrounds and expertise in the private sector, uh, academic research, social justice, advocacy, and technology. The other six members uh, represent uh, a diverse field of city agencies, the Administration for Children's Services, the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, the Department of Education, the New York City Police Department, and the, de uh, the Department of Social Services, and the Department of Transportation. You can find a full listing of all the members and their biographies on the ADS Task Force website, uh, so you can read more about kind of their, con their, their backgrounds uh, on the task force. As required by the law, um, the task force was con first convened in May 2018 and has since met regularly to discuss strategy, deliverables, processes, research, and legal interpretations. As you can imagine, our discussions have at times been challenging. This is an emergency, emerging and continually evolving field about which many people, include, uh, including many of the experts on our task force, they have strong, differing opinions and keen lines of inquiry, special areas that they want to focus on, and these challenges, however, highlight exactly why a task force like ours is so important. When it comes to discussing the best practices around the use of ADS in government, the conversation must start somewhere, and no better place than with such a rich participation of different viewpoints. That, bring me, that brings me to our progress to date. So far, our task force, as I said, met regularly, both as a full group and in smaller groups focused on specific topics to work through the deliverables required by the local law by local law 49. We've worked hard to develop a process to make sure all members of the task force have room to be heard and as such have had many engaging important discussions with a specific eye towards identifying areas where we have agreement, those places where we have dissent and other areas for which we may have um, to break out time even beyond the task force to have further discussion. We've also developed and refined a processes that will keep our public engagement and research work streams on track and have been working diligently on preparing forums and sessions for the public engagement upon which our work is critically dependent. Since it was first convened, the task force has devoted a substantial amount of time to clarifying which systems and tools might fall under the law's definition of what constitutes an agency ADS. As you can imagine, this has been a challenging but essential step in the task force's work. And I'm not afraid to say it has taken more time than I think we originally thought might, um, that it would take. The law requires the task force to develop criteria to determine which ADS systems and tools should be subject to procedures it recommends. Because the law's definition of ADS is broad, many of our task force members immediately upon entering into this process flagged early that the task purview could very well include a vast array of computerized models along the spectrum of automation but to also include as generalized um, things as calculators or um, advanced Excel spreadsheets. We, logically then, we must therefore try to clarify what types of systems and tools do qualify as agency ADSs before we can create criteria to evaluate those which should or should not be subject to the task force's recommendations. To address this, we're uh, currently developing factors and considerations to help identify what constitutes an ADS tool or system with the input of the task force. Um, and from there, recommended criteria and procedures can then follow. To be clear, the ADS task force is not going to produce a list of algorithms in use by the city, but will develop and issue the recommendations and criteria mandated by local for law for 49 to allow agencies to do um, uh, citywide uh, assessments. Finally, that brings me to the vital role the public will continue to play in the work of the ADS task force. Later this month, the task force will be kicking off its public engagement efforts, which will include two large public forums at New York Law School on April 30th and May 30th, and then a series of community-based events throughout the summer. Because a large part of the task force mandate focuses on disclosing information, improving transparency, and addressing any disproportionate impact or harm to individuals and populations, it's vital that the task force hear not only from technical and subject matter expertise, but also members of the public who are impacted by these systems. Without such insights, our analysis would be incomplete. So using our own research and insights from the public, per the local law, the task force plans to release its uh, recommendations later this year. 
However, we know that our recommendations will not be the end of the discussion. In fact, many of us have focused on the fact that this is the beginning of that discussion. We look forward to continue the conversation around ADS and know that the task force efforts will inform continued work on this important subject. So thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today and to answer your questions. We are welcome to any questions you have for us. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. So um, my first question is, um, can you list the current members of the task force? Yes. Mm -hmm. Would you like it read for? They're available on the website, but if need be, oh, I can, can read it for yeah. sure. Um, we have as the co-chairs, me, Jeff Tamkitikasem, uh, Brittany Saunders of uh, the New York City Commission on Human Rights, Kelly Jin uh, of the directors, uh, as director of the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. We also have Salone Barocas, an assistant professor at Cornell University, <laughs> Shelby Chestnut, a national organizing and uh, policy strategist for the Transgender Law Center. I'm just for time maybe going to skip the title and actually just go yeah, to the okay. names. And Khalil Cumberbatch for New York's um, United for Justice, Howard Freeman at the DOE, uh, Judith uh, Germano um, for the New York City Center on Law and Security, Dan Heifetz at uh, DSS, Tanya Meisenholder at PD, Afif Nasher at the Council on American Islamic Relations, Michael Replogi at the uh, Transportation, Jennifer Rogers uh, for the Center of Advancement and Public Integrity at Columbia Law School, Julie Samuels at Tech NYC, Susan Summer at MockJ, Vincent Sutherland on the center, at the Center of Race, Equality, and Law at NYU Law School, and then also Julia Stojanovic um, at uh, New York University. Oh, sorry, back that, page. Uh. Andrew White uh, at ACS, Meredith Whitaker, um, AI Now Institute at NYU, Maya D. Wiley um, at the New School, and Jeanette Wing at uh, Columbia University. Thank you, yeah. So are these the original members of the task force that were initially appointed? Well, I will say that I am the new one. <laughs> uh, uh, because the uh, director of operations position changed, um, the movement of the chair uh, came to me as I took the position of the director of the mayor's office of operations. I've also appointed Kelly Jin, who is new as a co-chair with Brittany, who is an original member. Mm -hmm. uh, Kelly brings her background, certainly, as the director for uh, the mayor's office of data analytics. Thank you. So why is the task force lacking members from the private sector, you know, with the exception of NYC? I think one of the big things that we um, focused on was trying to build the most diverse group of people who could be involved in the conversation while still trying to facilitate kind of reasonable conversations. And so we inherently had a limit on numbers and we tried to address uh, people who not just identified with academics, who had uh, conversations with the um, private sector, but also city agencies because it did impact the city agencies themselves. I'll let Brittany, who was there in the beginning, also speak to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as you'll see from the legislation, as you're probably familiar, um, it really requires us to have folks who Um, so, as you'll see in the legislation, right, part of our mandate was to make sure that we selected folks who both had insight into the technologies, um, as well as folks who um, had insight with and experience with communities that have been impacted um, by these technologies. Um, and then, as Jeff mentioned, we added to that um, what we thought was a really critical expertise of um, folks who um, have some understanding of government and how policy is made and those sorts of questions. And I think within each of those categories, there's a really rich diversity of um, perspectives. Um, and I think we have, uh, you know, the precise mix of expertise that we need, but we also have other avenues for people to engage yeah. with us as well. So we've got um, community engagement sessions coming up, and there'll be opportunities to comment, and um, there are also opportunities to comment through our website as well. And certainly, Council Member, just to, to make a fair point, just because there's an actual task force member doesn't mean that we aren't trying to invite more voices to be a part of the conversation, either through these very formal public uh, forums, but also the network of task force members are tasked, in fact, to kind of reach out and have their own conversations to bring back, just so that we can limit the conversation within the proper task force process. So how often does the task force uh, meet? So we meet regularly. Right now, as of the beginning of this, we've had about 20 meetings. Um, 10 of them are really focused on kind of the entirety of the task force, and then maybe 10 or so are, are subgroups where um, the, a certain set of the task force members uh, talk about uh, a specific focus of the legislation. 
uh, we'll keep having more of these and, and we'll set out certainly some more public schedules for the public forums and those community forums that are going on during the summer. Oh, I'm sorry. Were the meetings recorded? No, the meetings haven't been recorded. Oh. So you don't have uh, minutes for that? Um, I mean, we, I yeah, mean, we take notes in terms of like mm -hmm. a focus on next steps and kind of the mm -hmm. ideas that are presented because we've tried to make a commitment within the uh, task force to make sure that every voice is heard and even if that document is an agreement or a dissent or a challenge, but we don't uh, have any formal kind of recording of it or an, an actual each thing that everybody said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the reason I asked that yeah. is because the state of Vermont, they mm -hmm. created a similar task force, yep. the, uh, which they properly poses its agenda and minutes. Mm -hmm. And so are your minutes of the task force uh, properly available? So I think, um, so to be clear, we don't have kind of specific minutes on what everyone has said in every meeting. Um, and part of the reason that you know, the meetings are kind of meetings of our members is because we want to make sure that people feel like they have an opportunity to speak uh, pretty openly about their concerns and their perspectives. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add about the rules. Yeah, I think I would add as we're heading into the upcoming public forums for April 30th, May 30th, as well as heading into the community session. So those conversations um, with task force members, but also with members of the public, those will all be clearly documented and also included as part of the, the broader report at the end mm -hmm. of this year. Okay. So did anyone other than members of the task force attend your meetings? I mean, some I think staff yeah, that I think we, we certainly have staff support um, huh. from the different agencies. Sorry. Um, the Mayor's Office of Operations provides staff support um, for different purposes depending on the topic of the discussion. Some are just for planning and others are actually for substantive conversation. So why are members of the city council not allowed to attend uh, these meetings? Well, I don't think that, uh, first of all, I um, think that what we have tried to do is offer several times to kind of brief the council on where we stand and we're happy to continue to offer that. I think one of the things, as Brittany had said, is we're also trying to kind of create a safe space for several of the members to kind of voice out and within the context of mm -hmm. that task force to have those private conversations that they need to kind of discuss through the issues and, and you know, disagree openly and, and come to consensus. Yeah, but, but as Jeff said, I think we're happy to brief you. Yeah, so, so can we participate in the next meeting you have? I Send mean, somebody? The way, well. Well, Jose, I think that certainly we're setting up the public forums and other uh, community meetings to have people in there. We'd like to create and mm. keep within the just the general task force um, the opportunity for them to speak freely within mm -hmm. that task force, within that membership. But we're very happy to even have several members come and we can talk about it in terms of a briefing. Okay. Yeah. So I have some questions on... Okay, yeah, it's gone. So could you list ADS that have, you have examined? Uh, please name the at least uh, five. Yeah. Sure, I yeah. mean, you wanna say? Sure, I, I think that one thing to be very clear about, we have not been focused on examining specific agency uh, ADS, mostly because what the focus of the task force is to provide and develop the guidance necessary for ADS, uh, for agencies to decide which systems may or may not fall into the definition of an ADS, mm -hmm. and then furthermore, what process we would want to engage in terms of what um, can be made public or not public. Um, so Right, yeah, and I think the way we view the work is really as a first step, right? So um, the tasks that are in front of us, um, as Jeff referenced in his testimony, are a pretty um, robust set of questions that the task force has to speak to. So. Um, you know, understanding what's in the universe um, of ADS is one of the primary ones that we've been focused on. Um, going beyond that to um, understanding how in individuals who are impacted by decisions made by ADS can get information about that, understanding um, how we can identify when systems are having a disproportionate impact on the basis of folks' membership in um, protected categories, how to address harm that comes out of that, how to um, make public information available and what's a process for that, and then beyond that, uh, the feasibility of archiving old systems. So those are really the first steps to kind of lay a foundation 
Um, and that's, I think, how this is supposed to work. Yeah, yeah, and I would also just add to, to both of my co-chairs up here, I think when you look at Local Law 49, um, the actual definition that's written out is incredibly broad. And so when we are speaking with uh, city agencies as part of this broader effort over the, the upcoming year, um, that conversation can be can start in one end, as Jeff stated in his testimony, of Excel spreadsheets that are living on somebody's computer, um, all the way to much more advanced, sophisticated um, analysis being done at, at city agencies. So again, I think back to also Brittany's point on this being step one uh, of, of the broader conversation. So um, what steps did you take, if any, in order to attain information about ADS? I think what, sorry. Um, again, just to, because of the questioning, we've stayed away from trying to kind of pull anything because there was already a focus on the task force to try to define the criteria for which we might kind of further talk to agencies about what would be in or out. But otherwise, we have been relying heavily on kind of the expertise and examples and, and uh, conversation topics of our task force members. Some of those bringing out questions based on their experience within the advocacy and the academic world, and then others uh, from the six city agency members talking through the, how they've um, automated certain processes or trying to kind of talk through what examples might fall or might not fall in. And so we're trying to categorize that and figure out what the common criteria or guidance might be that uh, allows for the entire city to look at ADS in the same way. So uh, you have not made any examinations uh, since the task force was created, right? We haven't um, focused on reviewing any specific systems. We've really been focused on the, you know, trying to advance the idea that um, this process has to kind of focus on mm -hmm. how to identify which of the systems give guidance because there isn't a common language on how to talk about it. And so from a transparency standpoint, um, we really want to focus on making clear that we can develop guidance for the city so that people can speak about it in the same way. And there isn't a question about just different agencies reacting different ways. Can you list the ADS that New York City currently uses? I don't have that list. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We yeah. haven't been focused on creating it. And again, the work of the task force really, um, as laid out in the legislation, is around setting out some foundational um, uh, guidance for agencies. And with one of the preliminary questions being, you know, how can we clarify the definition that's in the legislation? How can we so, kind of understand what's in that? So scope? can you forward the, the list to our committee? Again, I, I think that what we are waiting for is the finalization of the recommendations from the task force to uh, determine what guidance. One of the main goals of the task force also is um, recommendations on how to decide what parts can be made public and what the process is. Obviously, there are privacy and security kind of concerns that we have to develop with regards to what can be made public. Um, so I think that the work of the task force mm -hmm. is less about kind of providing any type of list mm -hmm. and really more about the underlying guidance and uh, recommendations on protocols and policies that the city should consider. Do you, do you know, do you know um, about any ADS the city uses? I mean, I, yeah. Yes, so again, our, our work has been really focused on trying to figure out how to clarify the definition of ADS in the legislation, and then how to set out some um, recommendations around rules of the road that the city should consider moving forward. Um, so we don't have like a, a list or, yeah. But part of the work also, to be clear, and Jeff referenced it, part of the work um, of the task force is also identifying a process for mm -hmm. determining when systems can be made public or what information about systems can be made public. So that's something that we're also hard at work on. So what is the definition of ADS? And the, the, ADS, the ADS is defined the law. So what is your definition? Yeah, and I think as I referenced inside the, um, the testimony, one of the things the task force members um, did right away was take a look at that definition, understand that it was pretty broad, and have immediate questions about what did or didn't fall into that, because one could take that broad definition and think about a very advanced Excel spreadsheet uh, sheet or a calculator, because it helps to make certain decisions. But obviously, those aren't the things that we're really concerned about. So while there is a definition, and we thank the start of it, mm -hmm. um, we, wanted to sp we spent time trying to clarify which parts of that require 
uh, further discussion and clarity for the purposes of actually using it. So you, you have uh, mentioned privacy, right? So how is privacy protected? So the city has a, a pretty robust set of privacy protocols that were developed by the um, uh, chief privacy officer working in collaboration um, with other folks. Um, and I think those, Part of what the task force is trying to do is to think holistically and broadly about the various different considerations that have to be um, that have to be considered um, when thinking specifically about the question of what m systems might become public. So those are precisely the sorts of questions that we have been discussing and will continue to be discussing, which is how do we account for all of this? Yeah, and Councilor, I think that um, in many ways a lot of the work of this task force, um, the privacy issues were also similar. I think the city is trying to grapple with something that is emerging and starting. Um, it, it pervades kind of government services now, not just the privacy issue, the type of data that we use, but also the systems. And uh, we're really focused on trying to tackle that transparency question. The city had recently stood up a privacy task force, and that task force also didn't go about identifying all the different pieces of information that should or shouldn't be private per se. It, guidelines that allow for agencies to develop agency-specific privacy protocols and policies so they can guide their specific things. Each agency has a different type of use, and so all of it um, needs guidance citywide, but then needs to be tailored at an agency level, and we're not there necessarily to kind of make those specific agency recommendations at this time. And I'll, I'll add, you know, one of the, the foremost foundations of this work is that we care about uh, New Yorkers and, and their information. And so I, as a guiding principle to this work, um, how do we ensure we're balancing that with um, the recommendations that we would come out with? Um, Brittany already mentioned our broad privacy work here within the, the city. Um, I would just echo that there are uh, privacy officers, agency privacy officers with, within each of those agencies. Um, and then more broadly that the systems, the, the ADS systems um, potentially across the city are really looking at individual level data. And there are hundreds of regulations that uh, govern the use of, of individual level data at the federal, state, and local levels. And um, those are all things that we're working on in partnership with uh, our, our colleagues across the city. And and I, oh, oh, I was just going to say, I should also mention that the city's chief privacy officer also plays an advisory role to the task force. So that's part of how we're trying to make sure that those issues come through. So um, was the method of differential privacy use? Differential privacy. Did you, did you use the method? I'm sorry if I don't quite understand that. Oh. I apologize. Insofar as we are, we have the chief privacy officer as an advisor, and we're trying to take into consideration within our own recommendations what type of protocols would also take into account privacy concerns. We are definitely doing that. Um, but, but if that's a term of art that yeah, refers that to some I specific, may, that may just um, yeah. So I, can I, I can chime in. So the, <laughs> the method of, of differential privacy is something that, again, as we are speaking with many different city agencies, may be a method that they are using. Um, but that is something that we will look into as part of the task force and, and the recommendations that we have. So how does this process balance privacy, security, and I'm sorry. How does the task force balance privacy, security, and transparency? Well, those are all concerns that we've been considering, particularly as we think about the questions of, you know, um, you know, what sorts of questions should we be asking? Should the, what sorts of things should the city be considering um, when it determines uh, what sort of information about these systems can be made public? But generally, themes like um, privacy and security, um, a commitment cross-cutting commitment to equity, these are all things that inform uh, the work of the task force. Uh, when was the task, task force uh, established? May. May? Yeah, launched in May of May 2018? Yes. Mm -hmm. So can you give us an exact day? Oh, so let me. So we have it as your task force established and 
on May 16, 2018. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So when is the report due? November. Yeah, end of November. In, in, in November? Mm -hmm. So we are looking forward to see the report and Uh, who is responsible uh, for drafting the report? Well, I think that um, in terms of staff support, the Mayor's Office of Operations has been staffing the task force itself, and so we'll uh, take all of the recommendations and uh, notes from the task force members. Uh, I'm sure there will be some um, drafting by some of the task force members themselves, but ultimately the Mayor's Office of Operations will kind of package together. Well, it's only April, but well, have you started drafting the report? <laughs> no, I think what we're trying to do is just document a lot of the uh, notes so far, and obviously we're going to get, sorry, uh, we will gain a lot more out of these public forums and uh, the summer community, uh, smaller community meetings. Okay, thank you. So uh, now we want to talk about public outreach, yeah. So after hearing, after our hearing date was posted in uh, February, the task force uh, lands two public meetings to be held on uh, on April 30 and, and May 30. Well, we appreciate that you reach out to the public. So what is the goal of the outreach? Yeah, so, um, you know, we've had a long-standing commitment, I think, to making sure that um, insights from the public inform the work of this task force. Um, and so part of what we're trying to do in the sessions that we'll be holding um, in April and May is to make sure that we can talk about some of the work that we've done to date and where we see the work heading. Um, also make sure that we um, invite some folks in to share some of their particular insights um, specific to um, the questions before us in the legislation. Um, I should also say that we define the kind of realm of expertise that's gonna be useful here really broadly. So to include people who've been impacted yeah. by the technologies, um, people who have you know, specific expertise on kind of the technological aspects, people who might be subject matter experts in particular um, policy domains. Um, as well as to have some time set aside for members of the public to you know, voice their concerns and their ideas and their insights as well. And then we're gonna follow those two sessions up um, with uh, smaller community engagement sessions during the summer. So I think we anticipate that you know, we'll have the large sessions, but there may still be constituencies or groups that we haven't heard enough from. And so we'll wanna make sure that we um, go out and connect with those folks and get some of that specific um, insight as well. Yeah, and I think there also is, uh, Brittany covered this um, a, a little already, but I think because we are talking about a very complex um, field mm -hmm. and complex terms that um, you know, we wanna make sure that these conversations are not just with technologists mm -hmm. uh, in, in the room, uh, in these forums and, and at the community sessions. So we do wanna make sure that we're having these broader conversations in, in the open um, and being transparent about that. So who is invited to the forums? That is something we're working through right now yeah, with the yeah. task force members. Yeah, we've, uh, we, we, we're committed to the diversity of viewpoints that we can bring to this um, field, not just those who are inherently kind of knowledgeable about what an ADS might be, but actually people who may feel just that, they, that there is an impact in direct services. So we've solicited um, from the task force members themselves and are thinking through other options just to make sure we get mm -hmm. as wide a group as we can get. Have you invited some experts? Yes. Yeah, we, we in yes. Yeah. Yeah? Yes. So who is responsible for analyzing the results of the outreach? Well, I think that ultimately what we were trying to do is ensure that a lot of this outreach is not just for the three of us or even the staff, but for the entirety of the task force. So each task force member would then have the opportunity to kind of hear what's going on, come back, we'd have a session with the task force to discuss through what we heard, and then, um, one of the purposes of the smaller groups in the summer would be potentially to follow up on areas where task force members may raise kind of questions or ideas they didn't hear about, they wanna hear more about from the public. So it's kind of staggered in order to allow us to kind of follow up. Well, the, the first uh, uh, meeting will be in uh, New York Law School. Where is the second uh, meeting taking place? 
both of the large um, public engagement forums are going to be at New York Law School. Yeah, at New York Law School? Yeah, but we anticipate that the community sessions will probably be in the outer boroughs, but they're not returning yet. Mm. The other so uh, I would suggest you know, have some meetings in the outer boroughs, in mm -hmm. Queens or in Brooklyn. You know. Yep. Uh, now I have some questions on public comments. Right? On your website, you solicit public opinions, uh, public or, uh, comments. How many comments did you receive? We have to, we'd have to check. I don't actually have that uh, offhand. Sorry. Uh, what is the process of addressing them? Well, after you receive the comments, how, how, what is the process of addressing them? Well, I think, would measure this. Yeah, I think ultimately we pull them out and uh, would uh, provide them to the and add them to kind of our task force to the task force for consideration. Um, some will be bucketed, others, if they're broader, we'll just kind of address them holistically. Has the task force connected, uh, connected with uh, individuals who were directly impacted by an ADS? That is part of the goal of the um, public engagement that we're doing. So we've actually specifically identified, um, you know, individuals who identify as being ac impacted by ADS as one of the categories of folks that we want to um, invite to participate in the sessions. Um, and I think we also anticipate that if if um, we don't think we hear enough of that feedback in the large sessions, then we will definitely um, go out and do um, some of that more um, aggressive outreach through um, or in in preparation for the community sessions. And I think we'd be um, working through our task force members and through other connections to try to identify who those people might be. Do people uh, who were impacted by uh, ADS uh, come to your meeting? So the meetings have been, you know, folks who are like sitting on the task force, so we have not yet had have folks who are impacted. But I think we'd be very open to having folks, um, you know, join us for a meeting or something like that. Can you walk through the process uh, for determining whether an algorithm has a disproportional impact on members of protected group? So that's a very important question and precisely the sort of question that the task force is, one of the questions that the task force is working on right now. Yeah. So I, yeah. So can you walk us through the process? We haven't determined or yeah. finalized that you process haven't yet. Yeah, that's, part, that's one of the recommendations that we're coming forth with. Okay. So what relevant technical information of the systems uh, uh, do you plan to reveal? So um, I think I mentioned earlier that one of the things that we are um, tasked with doing is uh, de developing a process or recommendations around the process for making information publicly available. Um, and so as part of that, we're trying to develop a protocol um, that would account for you know, security concerns, privacy concerns, maybe proprietary concerns, and other things. That's helpful for everyone. Okay. So I have one more question, and then I will ask the members to ask questions. So, how do you recommend to identify the instances uh, of the disproportional, uh, disproportionate impacts? Uh, can you address these impacts if they are found to exist? Yeah, so um, that, that question of, you know, how bias may be operating um, through technologies is a really important one, and um, one that I think we have particular interest in at the commission, but it's also a commitment that's shared and interest that's shared across the task force. But that's actually one of the recommendations that we um, are tasked with uh, mm -hmm. de like delivering at the end of this process, so we don't have a final answer on how that would work. Oh, okay, I have one more question, sir. Uh, the Committee on Technology uh, recently received several letters from advocates addressed to the task force, uh, the, to the task force chairs, including a letter dated January 22nd, 2018, mm -hmm. and one August 17, uh, 2018, March 1st, 2019. Those letters uh, said recommendations to the task force. Copies of these letters are also available online. Did you discuss these letters with the task force members? Well, I mean, yeah, yeah that information has definitely informed our discussions. The first letter was helpful in terms of identifying who we might 
um, appoint to the task force. Um, it's informed our conversations around public engagement. Another question that they want to address. Yeah, and I think the other letter certainly kind of gave us an impetus to kind of move forward with a little more clarity on process leading up to the production of the recommendations. I think as, um, you know, again, all of the people on the task force really want to address this issue and tackle the uh, questions around transparency and accountability and being able to offer good recommendations to allow the city to kind of act more proactively. Um, being the first in this nation, I think it, it's, a, it's a challenging conversation. So what we've been trying to do is uh, in the first you know, months of the conversation, there was a little more time, as I stated, focused on just on criteria that might fall in or out. As we move forward, we wanted to kind of make sure there was a little more clarity on how we were going to move forward to actual recommendations. And there, we had a lot more discussion around the decisions to just say, look, we have a limited amount of time, and we know this is the beginning, so it's better if we just accept what we have agreed to, accept what we dissent and disagree on, mm -hmm. and then identify the topics for which we know that more time is going to be necessary, because nothing... Um, would be more important than kind of reflecting the diversity of mm -hmm. viewpoints that everyone has on the task force. Everyone cares, so we want to get all of that out on the recommendations. Thank you. So Council Member Holden? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Koo, and thank you all for your testimony. It's a daunting task ahead of you. It, looks, it sounds like 18, you had 18 meetings, you said, already? Just around, yeah, 18, 20. D now, like after that. the report comes out in November, mm -hmm. is the task force going to continue to, to meet? So technically under the law, it's disbanded within 60 days of the release of the report. Okay, so, but there's not a, an idea to put a smaller task force to continue, to, because everything changes, we know technology changes, and whatever you come out with a report in November, there's, there could be advances and so forth. Uh, yeah. And, and, and I, I think that from the task force standpoint, we've all had conversations about the fact that our recommendations won't just be necessarily answering right. these, but we want to talk about what's next as well. Yeah. Now, we all know that some agencies are more transparent than others. And it sounds, it sounds like, I mean, it's some of the comments that you said, um, you're leaving it up to the agency to determine their priorities. Is that, would that be correct? Well, I think what we want to do is also pay deference to the fact that each of the different agencies has different services that they are providing to New Yorkers. And so while we want guidance for the entire city on what systems should fall in or shouldn't and what things, um, the procedures and processes that may um, work for um, identifying disproportionate impact, how people can appeal. We want to in, you know, defer in terms of operationally how the agencies would actually enact and move forward with those but, policies but, and protocols. But what I, what I think is, is yeah. and you might discuss this in the task force, that the agency might not recognize that they can be more transparent and or they should be more transparent. So we need somebody to, actually outside the agency to say, this is what you're not providing, this is what should be provided. Um, and I think that is important for somebody on the outside looking in. And um, I don't know if you take that back, because I wouldn't rely so much on the agency, especially if there's a problem that's been recognized by the public or a, a perception. Sure. So will we'll you, raise that. Will you raise that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, appreciate it. Um, OK, I guess that's it. Thank you. We are joined by Council Member Yeager. So uh, let me ask a couple more questions then. Do ADS use uh, advanced technology such as deep learning? Just to echo some of our, our earlier comments, um, there's a, a whole variety of, of different technologies that are, are changing uh, week to week and, and year to year. Um, I think, again, just to mm -hmm. say that we are working in partnership with our, our city agencies, but I could not say in particular uh, if anyone is using deep learning. So how does the city plan to make petitions by deep learning uh, in interpol? Uh, in I mean, um, so yeah, I think obviously transparency and the ability for, of New Yorkers to understand mm. um, how these systems are operating and how they may be, may be impacted by them is one of the key drivers behind the legislation here. Um, and, you know, one of the, as I mentioned before, one of the areas where the task force has to develop a set of recommendations is around um, 
what information can be made um, available to New Yorkers who might be impacted by a particular decision, um, or what information should be made um, more generally public available to New Yorker, publicly available to New Yorkers, and how what, what's the process for determining that? So that is um, certainly uh, part of how we'll be addressing those concerns. So uh, I think that we can make deep learning uh, interpretable. Oh. Yeah. So how can you do it? Yeah. Oh, well, I would imagine the question of how <laughs> you make deep learning interpretable <laughs> is a question, <laughs> a big issue in the kind of computer science and data science. Yeah, so I think there is an, an element of, uh, like we've been saying, how can we better contextualize the terms that we're using, which is um, something the task force is working with, just mm -hmm. with the, the term automated decision systems. Deep learning is, is one of them. Mm -hmm. There's many terms in, in the broader technology and, and data space that we're working uh, with. Um, and just to echo my uh, uh, Brittany's point there, uh, um, there are a lot of existing protections in place, mm -hmm. um, and that algorithms and, and ADSs are augmenting uh, decision making uh, and supporting decision making within city agencies. Thank you. Yeah, we will send you uh, follow-up questions. Okay. Uh, Great. Okay. So, um, thank you for testifying before us. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you. No more further questions. Uh, we have the second panel: uh, Albert Kane, Jeanette Haven, and Rashida Richardson. Uh, we'll start with Janet. Janet Haven? Yes. Uh, you can yes. identify yourself and begin. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Janet Haven. I am the executive director of the Data and Society Research Institute. Um, I'm sorry? Is the mic on? Yes? Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the Committee on Technology for having us here today and also the, the task force for the work that they have done to date. Um, this testimony was prepared together with Andrew Selbst, who is a postdoctoral scholar at Data and Society Research Institute uh, and a visiting fellow at the Yale Information Society Project. Um, we are an independent nonprofit research institute dedicated to studying the social and cultural impacts of data-driven and automated technologies. Over the past five years, Data and Society has focused on the social and legal impacts of automated decision-making and artificial intelligence, publishing research and advising policymakers and industry actors on issues such as algorithmic bias, explainability, transparency, and accountability more generally. Government services and operations play a crucial role in the lives of New York City citizens. Transparency and accountability in a government's use of automated decision-making systems matters. Across the country, automated decision-making systems based on non-public data sources and algorithmic models currently inform decision-making on policing, criminal justice, housing, child welfare decisions, educational opportunities, and myriad other fundamental issues. This task force was set up to begin the hard work of building transparent and accountable processes to ensure that the use of such systems in New York City is geared to just outcomes rather than only those which are most efficient. The adoption of such systems requires a reevaluation of current approaches to due process and the adoption of appropriate safeguards. It may require entirely new approaches to accountability when the city uses automated systems as many such systems through their very design can obscure or conceal policy or decision-making processes. 
We at Data and Society, along with many of our colleagues across the city, lauded the decision to establish a task force focused on developing a better understanding of these issues. Indeed, we celebrated the city leadership's prescience in being the first government in the nation to establish a much needed evidence base regarding the inherent complexity accompanying ADS adoption across multiple departments. Unfortunately, we've seen little evidence that the task force is living up to its potential. New York has a tremendous opportunity to lead the country in defining these new public safeguards, but time is growing short to deliver on the promise of this body with the report due at the end of November. So I would like to make two main points in my testimony today. First, for the task force to complete its mandate in a meaningful sense, it must have access to the details of ADS systems in use by specific agencies and the ability to work closely with representatives from across agencies using ADS. We urge that, task, that the task force members be given immediate access to specific agency level automated decision making systems currently in use as well as to the leadership of those departments and others with insight into the design and use of these systems. Social context is essential to defining fair and just outcomes. This city is understood to be using ADS in such diverse contexts as housing, education, child services, and criminal justice. The very idea of a fair or just outcome is impossible to define or debate without reference to the social context of the system. Understanding the different value trade-offs and decisions about pretrial risk assessments, for instance, tells you nothing whatsoever about school choice. What is fair, just, or accountable in public housing policy says nothing about what is fair, just, and accountable in child services. This ability to address technological systems within the social context where they are used is what makes the ADS task force so important and potentially so powerful in defining real accountability measures. The legislative mandate itself also demonstrates why the task force requires access to agency technologies. Under the enacting law, the purpose of the task force is to make recommendations particular to the city's agencies. Specifically, the task force must make recommendations for fit procedures by which explanations of the decisions can be requested, biases can be detected, harms from biases can be redressed, the public can assess the ADS, and the systems and data can be archived. Each of these recommendations apply not to automated decision systems generally, but quote, to agency automated decision systems, a term defined separately in the test of the law. Importantly, the law also mandates that the task force make recommendations about criteria for identifying which agency automated decision systems should be subject to those procedures. Thus, the legislative mandate makes clear that the task force, that for the task force to do its work, it will require access to the technologies that city agencies currently use or plan to use, as well as the people in charge of their operation. Lacking this level of detail on actual agency level use of automated decision making systems, the recommendations of this task force can only be generic. Such generic recommendations will be ineffective because they will not be informative enough for the city to act on. If the city wanted to find generic recommendations or guidelines for ADSs, it could have looked to existing scholarship on these issues instead of forming a task force. Indeed, there is an entire interdisciplinary field of scholarship that has emerged in the last several years dedicated to the issues of fairness, accountability, and transparency, otherwise known as fat star, in automated systems. This field has made significant strides in coming up with mathematical definitions for fairness that computers can parse and creating myriad potential methods for bias reduction in automated systems. But the academic work has fun fundamental limitations. Much of the research is, by necessity or due to limited access, based on hypothetical scenarios, toy problems, rather than real world applications of machine learning technology. This work is accomplished as a characteristic of theoretical modeling by stating assumptions about the world and data sets that are being used. In order to translate those solutions to the real world, researchers have to know whether the data sets and other assumptions match real world scenarios. Using information from city agencies, the task force has the ability to advance beyond the academic focus on toy problems, devoid of social context, and assess particular issues for systems used in practice. 
Without information about the systems in use, the task force's recommendations will be limited to procedures at a level of generality, things we would already guess, such as testing the system for bias or keeping it less complex so as to be more explainable. But with information about these systems, the task force can examine the particular challenges and trade-offs at issue. With community input and guidance, they can assess the appropriateness of different definitions of bias in a given context and debate trade-offs between accuracy and explainability given specific social environments. The recommendations of the task force will only be useful if they are concrete and actionable, and that can only be achieved if they are allowed to examine the way ADS operate in practice with a view into both the technical and the social systems informing outcomes. Second, we urge the task force to prioritize public engagement, and, and we're very glad to hear about the engagement that is planned. Because social context is essential to defining fair and just outcomes, meaningful engagement with community stakeholders is fundamental to this process. Once the task force has access to infor detailed information about ADS systems in use, public listening sessions must be held to understand community and experiences and concerns with specificity with the goals of using that feedback to shape the task force's process going forward. Iteration and reviewing of recommendations with community stakeholders as the task force moves forward will be important to arriving at truly transparent, accountable, and just outcomes. I'm here today because I believe, I continue to believe the task force has great potential. I strongly believe the task force's work needs to be undertaken thoughtfully and contextually, centering on cooperation, transparency, and public engagement. The task force's goals need to be offering actionable and concrete recommendations on the use of ADS in New York City government. We hope that the above testimony provides useful suggestions to move towards that goal. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Havens. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, we will review it in, again in our office. Uh, we know that you have prior commitments and understand you don't have time for questions. So uh, thank you very much for thank coming you. here to testify. Yeah. Um, we are joined by Council Member Landers. So we will proceed with the next panelist. Okay. Yeah. Please Hi. identify yourself and start. Yeah. Hi, my name is Rashida Richardson, and I'm the Director of Policy Research at the AI Now Institute at NYU. AI Now is an interdisciplinary research institute that focuses on the social implications of artificial intelligence, and a large chunk of my research and the work that we've been doing over the past year has been specifically looking at use cases with throughout the United States and globally to understand the impact of aut automated decision systems on society generally, but also developing governance frameworks that can help address many of the risk that we know um, accompany its use. What I submitted to the committee is actually copies of some of the advocacy letters that myself and some of the panelists who are here and others in the room have sent to the task force and to just leave with three recommendations for the committee based on our interactions to date. The first is that we um, strongly encourage this committee to continue to serve as an oversight function on the task force because we've been very concerned about the lack of progress to date and the lack of actual engagement in this process despite our best efforts to collaborate and cooperate with the task force um, members both on the city side and non-governmental members. Um, and also the part of the reason I um, put forth the letters that we've sent is because it includes robust recommendations that many experts and community members have worked on. So we hope that if this pro process does not go well, the City Council can use some of the work that we're trying to start and um, continue with dialogue so we, the City can continue to lead on this effort. And then I'll raise two concerns that I hope you can react to and I'm happy to stay for questions. The first is that I'm very concerned that the task force is proceeding without any type of context such as Janet has referenced. And the reason why it's important for them to actually focus on specific examples used in the city is because if you only look at generic use cases of automated decision systems, there's no way you can make meaningful recommendations to curtail some of the risk that current research is raising. To give a specific example, we know that the um, New York City is using pretrial risk assessments, and in fact, the mayor's office on criminal justice is in the process of redeveloping a pretrial risk assessment, yet 
each of those risk assessments that are either available off the shelf or developed individually vary differently and the risks that are associated with their use can vary drastically. And so if the city is not looking at the specific use cases that agencies are using, it's possible that their recommendations will be too vague and you'll see, you'll continue to see that the risk that research is warning of being perpetuated in the city. The second is the lack of um, a robust public engagement process. And while we are very happy about the recent announcement about the April um, and May hearings and the subsequent summer um, hearings, it is notable that us as a community of advocates and researchers did try to engage the um, task force last year, with including the robust letter that I mentioned was sent in August, and nothing has been done except for an acknowledgement that we've received that they received that letter in August until this past month. And there's increased. You're, you're sure that letter was not sent through an automatic? Response? No, we actually received a response from the chairs. <laughs> but I, I appreciate the humor. <laughs> Um, and But the other concern is today is April 4th and the first hearing is supposed to be on April 30th, but if you look at the press release that was released, there's no specifics on how the community can actually engage, to what extent people will actually be allowed to be heard and who will even be present. So it's a little concerning that these hearings are fastly approaching and they're the only opportunity for public engagement, yet no details for how the public will actually engage are in any of the public documents to date, and I'll stop and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Albert Kahn. I'm the executive director of STOP, the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, and we're a civil rights, police accountability, and privacy organization based here in New York City at the Urban Justice Center, and I've submitted formal testimony for the record that was prepared with the assistance of our resident technologist, Liz O'Sullivan. And like so many people here, I was very excited by the prospect of the task force when the council enacted it into law. When we took this leading role in trying to provide an accountability framework for these increasingly powerful forms of artificial intelligence and other ar uh, automated decision systems that are being deployed across the city and across the country. But while I, I had the pleasure of working with the task force for uh, its hearings last year, attending those sessions, it quickly became clear that we weren't living up to the expectations that advocates and lawmakers had for what this task force would be doing. You know, there are a number of specific issues that I detail in the testimony, but on a high level, they can be broken down into you know various groups, one of which is the fact that, as we've heard repeatedly, you cannot build a roadmap to the future if you don't know where you are today. You cannot build a comprehensive framework for ADS if you don't know what those tools look like, how they're being used, what the limitations are. And so it's indispensable to have access to a complete understanding of what tools are being used throughout the city if we're to have a meaningful framework for ADS regulation. Another difficulty is the fact that we've had this limited public engagement. This is a tough subject. It is a tough subject to have a citywide campaign to really engage the public on what it means to regulate ADS. There are a lot of technical barriers, and we need those individuals who are being impacted on by this, whether it's what school their kid goes to, or what uh, how they're treated in a pre-sentencing context, or, you know, housing issues. We need them to have a way to meaningfully understand how these tools work and, and how this task force is potentially addressing those issues. But we have not seen that style of engagement with the public. And what we're seeing now is an improvement with these planned fora, but it's too little too late. And to make the most of the time remaining for the task force, we need a larger citywide effort, not simply to have forums, but to have forums where members of the public can interact with task force members, where they can hold those members accountable, where we have much more public engagement and public education as a preliminary step to make sure that you, know, you don't just have self-selection of the people who are already engaged on this issue. Uh, because, I, I mean, I, I'm sure that if you start to have this conversation with a lot of constituents, it will take time for them to understand what this is and how it's impacting their lives. We also have concerns about the lack of leadership by task force members. You know, though, if you look at 
the law itself. It talks about members who are from nonprofits that represent individuals impacted by ADS, as well as technical experts in the field, and yet those individuals have not been leading the day-to-day -day management of the task force. Instead, it's been outside consultants, it's been individuals from the administration who have been really taking leadership of the direction of the task force process. And it's wonderful to have engagement, from such experienced and knowledgeable individuals in the administration, but for this to be an independent body that truly holds city agencies accountable for how they deploy ADS, it needs to be these outside experts who are the ones leading not just the internal discussions, but also the drafting process and the overall work of the task force. And, and similarly, I, I think really given how little time is left, that it's urgent that the council reestablish and reassert its expectations for what a task force report will constitute to make sure that we don't have a high level thought document, but that we have a document that goes into specific best practices for ADS that goes into some of the issues we've seen, not just around transparency, but about fairness and accessibility. A and with that, I'll, I'll end my remarks. Members, want to ask questions? Chair, I have a, I have a question about um, the um, uh, the unintended consequences uh, that were referred to in, in your testimony regarding the city's court administration, the um, uh, applications of AI in the court. Uh, you want a specific example? Yes, exactly, <laughs> please, yeah. Yeah, so um, the, what I mentioned was a pretrial risk assessment, and just to be clear, there's risk assessments used throughout the criminal justice system, that's just one specific um, case, and one major concern, which was profiled in ProPublica, um, and many other great articles is a great concern for racial bias in that if you right. have a system that is disproportionately filled with black and Latino individuals and you're creating a statistical model that's looking at the current prison population to gauge who may be at risk for not showing up for court, then you're more likely to have an out or have a risk <coughs> assessment that's going to lean towards the population that's already disproportionately represented within the um, jail population. Popula so that's just one specific concern, um, but then you can have other concerns depending on the type of risk assessment, and this is why knowing what the city is actually using is um, specific or in important because there's some risk assessments that only look at the individual who is being assessed information and other risk assessments that um, generalize based on the jail population or other criminal justice data. And in the former that I described, that is more preferential to some in that you're actually getting an independent decision about that individual, whereas some other tools you're making generalized um, suggestions based on a generalized group, which you can leads to some concerns about disparate impact and other issues. I wonder if the, if the city Department of Health is using any of this technology. Um, so there, I can only speculate based on research of looking nationally, but there, um, is at least one system that I know is being pushed by the CDC that's looking at HIV um, uh, or in trying to identify individuals who will be more likely to um, contract HIV based on existing populations in relationships or like a social network monitoring type system. Mm. And um, that I don't know for fact if the city is using, but that's one that I know is being pushed by the federal government and there's funds that comes with using that type of program. And then um, there are other types of programs like um, other STI monitoring uh, programs that can be used in prescription um, monitoring databases which, where you want to look at doctors who may be over prescribing yeah, their individuals. But I think that could be very helpful with the opioid crisis that we're facing right now. Yeah, but the problem is I'm giving you examples based on doing research globally and nationally and I don't know for a fact if any, if any city agency is using any of this. I mean, that and could be very helpful. And one thing to keep in mind is that these tools can be incredibly helpful in better allocating city resources. Right. but. You know, the city has seen historically what happens when you use an analytical framework that proves to be inaccurate or based off of faulty assumptions. I mean, historically, um, in and in FDNY uh, staffing, we saw back in the, I believe it was the 60s and 70s, an example of a RAND study that made certain assumptions about how many firehouses were needed based off of certain models of how fire. Uh, 
how the fire department was utilized. And that resulted in a huge increase in the amount of fires that went on as a result because there was faulty data, faulty assumptions. And in all of these contexts, we're dealing with more sophisticated tools that to the extent we're not policing the data and the underlying algorithms for bias, for errors, for other things that can distort the outcome, they may actually make things worse rather than making things better. And to give one more example that I think should be of major concern to this committee and the city as a whole is that there's major cost to these systems that we don't fully understand. And one specific example, which I don't know if the city is using, are public benefit um, algorithms that help assess who may be eligible or terminated or the level of benefit for SNAP, Medicaid, and other public benefits. And there's been lawsuits in Arkansas Idaho and a few other states that have resulted in huge settlements that the state has had to give up and those states are now still trying to figure out how to redo or fix what was already done and that's something where we're now looking back a few years to see what's happening and it still is not resolved but if we don't have a good grasp on what's currently being used I also think the city would be very concerned about liability in the long run of these systems. That's, that's probably true but I think in the area of public health it could be extremely helpful uh, particularly with juvenile uh, issues, you know, related to obesity and um, chronic health conditions that sometimes develop later on in life as a result of lack of access to nutrition or park space or, you know, these are things that we know to be common sense, but if we can find a way to really work it into a, a system that could help us make decisions and allocate resources, it might be very helpful. And I'll just say my emphasis on the risk does not mean that I don't understand. Yeah. There are tons of benefits that can be gained. Yeah, I'm and concerned I about privacy yeah. rights and people's ability not to be monitored by big mm -hmm. government, everything from, you know, where they go, what they eat, their blood pressure, their, you know, mm -hmm. what they had for dinner last night. It's nobody's business, quite frankly. But, um, you know, with respect to, again, the, the public health uh, and also education, uh, educational outcomes. I think the Department of Education, they spend hundreds of millions of dollars on consultants and contracts that we don't even know about. We have to find out about it at the hearings at budget time, uh, that if there was any way to harness some of this technology to really try to look at student outcomes and how students learn and how we can put them on a better track of reaching their full potential, I think AI could be very helpful because it, it does take away the bias when, when, it, when it does have the right variables in, you know, in the I, algorithm. I, I actually wanted to push back on that point because I, I would say actually all AI is biased. The question is whether you can reduce that bias to a level below what you see with human decision makers. But even in the best circumstances, you will see some elements of bias entering these systems, either in how they, in what data is used, in how that data is evaluated, in the myriad of subjective decisions that go into shaping how these tools work. And so AI as a class, is no different than human decision makers, say like judges. You can have a judge who you think is making consistently good decisions, you can have a judge who you think is making consistently bad decisions, but they're all using subjective heuristics and, and AI can be more powerful, but that doesn't mean it's more fair and it doesn't mean that it's more effective. And, and who would, just very quickly, who would, I'm ignorant to this, but who are the uh, major developers of the AI technologies that are being sold to municipalities? Who are we buying them from? So Is it Microsoft? Is it Google? I don't know. I'm, yeah, I'm so I can give you some generic names, but you really have to get down into the types of use and what agency uses, because there's some vendors that only work in certain sectors. So you have I, all the big companies, so IBM, Microsoft, Google, um, Amazon, they all offer services that the city probably is using in some regard, but then you also have um, smaller companies, so to narrow in on a specific, in policing, there's um, technologies called predictive policing, which help determine where a crime may occur or who may be a victim or a perpetrator of a crime, and there you have sort of niche vendors like Hunch Lab, um, Palantir, Predpol, and they primarily work in the policing space. So it, it's like you really have to get into what sector are you right. interested in and then look at the vendors. Well, you mentioned level. Microsoft, right? So does Microsoft currently contract with the city to provide AI and in what area? I, d I don't know. I'm not familiar. Well, one of the difficulties we have is that since the task force hasn't been given a comprehensive list of the AI and ADS systems that are being used by agencies, I don't think there's anyone well, in this room know who that. can give you an answer. Yeah. Why don't we know that? Well, because why do we have a, a task force? 
Yeah. Okay, but <laughs> but when is the task force going to be done and tell us? I mean, that's the. You well, were saying well, the same thing Thursday. Yeah, okay. We need a lot more information. We need to know a lot about right. the task force before okay, it starts. Yeah. If we're anyway. Lenny, you Thank you. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, yes, and I, I think you know, in some ways we'll follow on all these lines. But I, I'm going to um, ask you for sort of a little real-time consulting, uh, but that I think is designed to help us better understand um, kind of what is ADR as well. And actually, I, I think I asked Noel this sort of some similar questions at the COPIC hearing that we had. So. I'm currently working on a bill, uh, and I'm not sure whether it's uh, ADR or not. Uh, so I have been focused on uh, dealing with reckless drivers who put New Yorkers at, at grave risk of death and injury. Uh, about a year ago, uh, a driver in my district killed two young kids, and it turned out that she had five speed camera and red light violations in the preceding year. Um, and so there was some indication that she was a reckless driver, and, and perhaps if we had acted on that before, then she would not have killed um, these two young, young kids. We then, Twitter sort of um, took to using the existing data about the camera violations and started to look at um, how many other drivers are there with that bad a record. And it turned out she was in the top 1% of reckless drivers, but that, that means there are about 25,000 other drivers who have equally bad or worse track record of driving. They had had violations of that, you know, five or more in a year. So we're putting a bill together to say, when you get to five, we want there to be a consequence. Uh, most people, if you get just one of those tickets, you don't get a second one. But this set of people, like, in my opinion, they're driving sociopathically. They don't care about, you know, the hell. They care more about their convenience than the lives of their neighbors. So we would like to like make them take a class that's been proven to reduce recidivism and reckless driving, and if not, boot or impound their cars until they do. So that's a kind of automated decision making. Like we are making a, a decision, I think, that that set of people are, have a risk of causing harm. Now it's based on behaviors, not on identity, um, but it, you know, I don't know for sure that, that which ones of those 25,000 are going to injure or kill someone if we don't make them do this class. So I guess a couple of questions. Like one, th we are making the algorithmic decisions, in this case, like in the legislation, mm -hmm. but so it's pretty transparent at least, although I could see giving DOT the ability to adjust it over time so that if they discover better predictive information, like if they could add hit and run information, which currently is like locked away in NYPD file drawers, so we just don't have it electronically, so I guess a couple of questions. Is that automated decision making? Um, and therefore, like, should it show up in the task force's information? Like, where's the line between using data um, and leaving it to some, you know, computer to do the AI or algorithmic work? Um, yeah, let me, let me just leave it there and ask for your help in thinking this through. Um, so I think there is a way to see what you described as an automated decision system, but there's a few details I would need to know to d feel more confident in that. Um, and I'm more looking to help us understand the boundaries right. than, so, you know. So if, let's say, you had some type of matching algorithm or alert system so you could identify who within the existing database already has five or more um, violations, that's the technical part, but there's still some type of hu human decision making, and what and what I just described there is most of the systems that we're seeing used in government right now, and that they're assisting or in or, or in some cases supplanting government decision making, but using some type of technical system to either analyze, predict, or identify um, people within existing data. So, I I'd, I'd say loosely yes. Uh, on a broad definition that could fit an automated decision system. And, and uh, having worked with uh, your staff on the bill, one, one concern that comes up with this, as with any form of predictive policing, is w we frame it as we, we're basing it off of behavior, not identity. But when you drill down, you're using a data set of who has gotten five of these violations. That then requires us to look at where the cameras are that are detecting those violations. It ha makes us n look at 
is there are these cameras placed equally throughout the city or are they disproportionately in neighborhoods where New Yorkers of color will be identified and receive violations where uh, poor individuals will be identified and those sorts of elements of bias can come in like any other form of ADS and so wherever we're trying to eliminate the human discretion the human decision making that would potentially evaluate those differences and create a uniform rule, I do think the same sort of ADS concerns uh, come into play. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but it means that we need to be rigorous in how we test those uh, sort of ADS tools to make sure that we aren't creating additional levels of bias in the, in the system. Okay. I mean, I think that's helpful. And as you know, like, we've been trying to think about that in this mm -hmm. one and, and make sure. And I think a standard that would say the, you know, the, the algorithm is transparent and we test it for disparate impact seem sensible to me. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my, my next question is, I understand the concern that like if we only have a level of generality that is more or less what I just said, I, you know, the task force might not be able to do useful work if it sort of is so general that it, you know, without, but um, what would it look like at another, you know, I guess on the flip side, um, you know, um, saying every time we use Da you know, I, I don't know, how do we figure out the right level of specificity because it doesn't seem realistic to expect that every time we are using some kind of data analysis or algorithm, we could subject it to the kind of transparency and scrutiny and analysis. So, uh, how, you know, how do we find a middle ground that is, um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's my question. How do we find a reasonable middle ground? I, I think there's definitely a spectrum of responses and we could go it with a variety of different routes. I think for something as ambitious as the task force, part of the hope was that we would create best practices. Maybe we wouldn't analyze each and every system and give it a report card or a scorecard on how well it's doing, but that we'd come up with a framework for analyzing those tools, and then going forward, that framework could be used to educate New Yorkers, empower them when they are the victim of discriminatory ADS, and really create that system. The, you know, because in 18 months, you couldn't do that. You couldn't create something that was future-proof and was robust enough to hit each and every one of those tools. But it's, so I, I can certainly understand there would be a flip side where we're trying to create a watchdog that's looking at each and every Excel document and in state government, that's obviously not what we want, but I think there's a lot of room between where we are and where that would be. I'm and I, I would also add, um, I supplied the letter we sent last August, that was recommendations based on a general understanding of the problem. So mm -hmm. we that's an attempt at starting a conversation or at least some discourse on what could a middle ground be without specificity. But the reason why it's important for the city council to have specific examples because there's some recommendations like disparate impact that will vary by the types of use cases by agency and other issues that I think we gave a starting ground of here's what we're thinking based on our general understanding, but it's important to narrow in based on the concerns and, and let me be clear, I don't mean that there shouldn't be specific examples mm -hmm. available to and analyzed by the task force. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking more downstream mm -hmm. to what are the kinds of recommendations. You know, so for example, w you know, um, audits are something you do when you have a, a set of rules you want to apply. It's not reasonable to expect that there'll be a front end process visible and transparent and through public review every time you do it but you don't just want to like wave your hand and hope and so you like audit a certain set of them for compliance. So yeah, I mean obviously we need, I mean I totally, I share your point, I think the committee it seems like is in, in sync that the task force will need specific examples to workshop, mm -hmm. develop some clear best practices and come to a set of recommendations that aren't just such high level principles that they can't have impact. I'm just trying to think a little bit to how we would make sure that our systems broadly were complying with them once we got through it. And of course there are ways to automate that process and to have additional layers of review. It wouldn't necessarily have to be manual human review for each and every tool, but to the extent you had that framework, you could imagine 
you know, having a parallel to uh, NYC's open data initiative, that would be some sort of portal that would allow different uh, access to different programs, or you could have different standards depending on the scale of the ADS. So there are a lot of different ways you could you could scale it up so that it was proportional to the tool that was being deployed. But um, and hopefully in its final recommendations, the task force will have a, a framework along those lines. And just to be clear, there's also a lot of work I think that would fall on the vendors during, and this would be part of a procurement process, so things that are not already in use in the city. And one specific example is that um, from that I've learned from doing research in this area is not a, a lot of the systems already used in government, there haven't been specific validation or bias studies done. Mm -hmm. And having a requirement where any vendor that's contracting with the city or any type of service or product that's used in the city, there's been confirmed that there's been a study and it's been reviewed and open to either experts or those in the city to review is something that would technically fall on the vendor but would give greater assurances than we have right now. Thank you. So thank you. Yeah. So let me ask you, Mr. Kane, uh, a question. Mm -hmm. So in your testimony, uh, you have stated that uh, Jeanette Family Foundation. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us more about uh, these meetings? Oh, yes. Uh, so as part of the task force meetings, we had the Jane Family Foundation preparing documents uh, to assist with the task force. And one thing that drew complaints from several members was that, you know, you know, this was not a task force member, it was not an organization that was officially part of the process, and yet they were, um, for some portions of our work, you know, driving much of that process to the point where they were creating proposed language for sign off by task force members and, you know, providing, a, you know, I in some ways, rather than supporting the process, at times it felt like they were steering the process. What do you expect from the task force and its report? Unfortunately, at this point, I don't know what to expect. It, it, there's very little time left for drafting a report of the scale we're uh, discussing. And given that we're only now beginning public engagement, to the extent that the report is responsive to the engagement we see at future meetings, it, it's impossible to predict what the report will say in the end. But given that we heard earlier today that there's not even consensus around the definition of what an EDS is. It's hard for me to see how we go from that position today to having a comprehensive framework for how you evaluate, regulate, and you know, uh, use EDS in the future. So let me ask you a very broad question for both of you. What, AD, what ADS are important to examine? What ADS are important to examine, in your opinion? So it's a little hard to answer because I don't want to create a hierarchy of risk um, with different use cases, but I do think some of the use cases in criminal justice, public health, child welfare, education um, are all examples where there's a heightened risk of civil rights and liberties being implicated in problematic ways, but the absence of listing off other use cases, I wouldn't want to say those aren't equally important because part of the problem we have is a lack of transparency. So if we don't fully understand the spectrum of use cases, then it's difficult to sort of rank which risks are higher than another. I, I, I agree to an extent it's a known unknown. What I would say is in my mind, to the extent that you are gonna create any sort of pri prioritization, it should be proportional to the potential deprivation of liberty. So where we're dealing with tools that potentially can deprive people of their freedom, uh, you know, policing tools, that those to me would be some of the highest uh, priorities. Mm. But then again, as someone who uh, heads a police accountability organization, we clearly have an institutional bias in that direction. And I would also say any type of tool that would have a negative effect on outcomes of an in individual, so that's where you get the education and child welfare um, type of examples. Do you have any suggestions as to how the task force and its process could be improved? 
Well, I believe Ms. R uh, Richardson has submitted letters that detail uh, a number of suggestions from a coalition of uh, organizations. And you know, we stand by those suggestions and we continue to believe that the items we lay out, such as you know, expanded community engagement are quite crucial for um, the, this process and the time left. So how do you see your involvement of the task force? At this point, it's a little unclear. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, we still don't even know the format of the upcoming hearings or what level of engagement will be allowed. So if I'm allowed to give testimony, I look forward to participating in that um, capacity and also bringing along any other advocates and researchers who have a point of view to share. But given that we're at April 4th and the first hearing is April 30th and we have no clue on how we can even engage, I'm a little concerned at how I may be able to um, proceed. Similarly, I, I would welcome the opportunity to testify or engage in those public hearings, but it, it, it's unclear at this point. And to clarify uh, my testimony, as I said in the written document, while I participated in the task force hearings, uh, the internal meetings, I was never officially a member of the mm -hmm. task force, but I would also welcome the opportunity to continue some unofficial uh, role with it. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Or? Yeah. Okay. So, okay, one more question. <laughs> Do you know about similar task forces in other jurisdictions? So in the uh, March 1st letter that I provided, we listed off a few examples. So Vermont followed suit of New York, and I've heard that from people in Vermont, in creating a statewide task force. And currently there's legislation pending in Massachusetts and Washington, and a few other um, states and localities are contemplating similar legislation to create bodies to look at similar issues. And we also have examples from Pennsylvania, from California. We, you know, it really, it, it's quite sad that something that we were a national leader in, we're now uh, falling behind these other localities and their level of public engagement. Yeah, thank you for your testimony. We will they, uh, review your suggestions and take appropriate actions. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next panel, we have uh, two people, Noel Hidalgo and Jordan Crow. Yeah, you may identify yourself and start. Yeah. Great. Um, my name is Noel Hidalgo, Executive Director of Beta NYC. Um, my printer broke. I apologize. So I submitted the testimony via Twitter, and I'll also be emailing it uh, to you. Uh, I will summarize um, the testimony briefly. Um, it's uh, in 2016, we wrote a, um, uh, posted something to our blog that said that we wanted to ensure that New York City leads the way in algorithmic, uh, uh, ethical algorithmic government. We want transparency around data tools, algorithms, artificial intelligence, and tracking. And we want New York City to be the thought leader in a smart, ethical, algorithmic government. We posted that on the 4th of January, 2016. Uh, it's been 1,186 days since then, uh, and as you know, the council has p introduced legislation, the legislation's passed, a task force has been crystallized, two press releases have been published, and two public hearings have been scheduled, and from the public's perspective, that's pretty much all that has happened. Um, and um, from, uh, uh, we, th we thank you for hosting this hearing to bring transparency on this particular subject. Uh, on March 1, we joined the broad coalition that was mentioned beforehand by Rashida, uh, asking for a robust and inclusive public engagement process, a review of the evidence-based research and ongoing public communication about the task force process and work uh, necessary that predicates to any publication of the task force produces. Uh, and sadly, um, we have great concerns about the output of the process if there is no transparency on it. And on the transparent, on the wet, excuse me, 
on the task force's website. You can't find press releases. You can't find meeting notes. Uh, you can't find actions that it's taken so far. You can't find any timelines nor the task force's processes. And this is extremely disappointing. While we're honored to have privately met with some of the co-chairs and one of the few groups being considered for follow-up community meetings, we're offering the following uh, advice for the task force. Uh, first and foremost is update the website. Uh, share as much information as possible about the task force. This includes press releases, task force meeting dates, agendas, timelines. Um, additionally, as we're heading into this public events uh, uh, time period, make sure that there's a public events calendar, and explicitly have a public glossary of terms that, uh, 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 public glossary of terms. This is actually a fundamental step in making sure that people who attend these public meetings understand what is being said. Um, second to that process, uh, while I can see who's on the task force, I cannot see how the task force will be making its re recommendations nor uh, how it will be making its res recommendations. We call on the task force to openly publish its process and its timeline. We cannot trust the outcome of this task force without transparency of the process. When it comes down to physical public forums, first we want them all to be recorded and, and or live streamed. We want for them to be uh, um, effectively constructed. Rashida clearly articulated the great concern that many of us have in regards to the structure of these public forums. Um, she said it better than anything, uh, any, any way that I could say it. Um, additionally, these conversations must be held at an accessible level. Many of the ter terms and topics that we discuss are technical and academic, and those things need to be kept to a minimum. And there's obviously going to be need for a, a massive amount of translation, whether it's in language or in terminology. Um, we want to ensure that these physical hearings uh, have a digital analog. And right now, the community has been using NYC algorithms, plural, um, as the hashtag to kind of centralize that conversation. And we hope that these public forums will also embrace that hashtag and be able to allow for public dialogue through Twitter. When it comes down to the public community forums, we're one of the few groups that have been contacted. We're excited about this, but once again, we want to make sure that the community public forums are accessible um, to as many people as possible um, to the extent that we want those task force, the task force website to be representative of all community public forums. Even if it's a task force member that is going out to represent their work, we want that reflected on the website. Lastly, we want uh, to encourage the task force to use some digital forums for dialogue. Um, there has been this tool that uh, Councilmember Lander has talked about, Consul, which is a great platform um, that we've seen in Europe uh, as well as in across uh, the Americas using ways to solicit and gather feedback and have a positive, constructive online dialogue around idea generation and commenting. And we implore the task force to uh, explore console or other tools that will enable this dialogue to happen not only in the phys physical public forums, but in the community forums and ultimately online. And that, we conclude our testimony. Good afternoon, my name is Jordan Kroll. I am a director of state and local with the Information Technology Industry Council. Chairman Koo and members of the Committee on Technology, on behalf of the members of the Information Technology Industry Council, or ITI for short, thank you for the opportunity to share our perspective on the New York City Automated Decisions Systems Task Force. ITI's public sector work represents more than 80 of the most innovative companies offering hardware, software, services, and solutions of information and communication technologies to state and local governments like New York City. We appreciate the work this committee, in conjunction with the task force, has done to study the responsible use of automated decision making and algorithms in city government. Many of our member companies actively provide services to New York City, and several of them likely rely on automated decision-making systems to provide the most efficient and cost-effective services to constituents. While the potential benefits of these systems and artificial intelligence broadly are wide-ranging, we are still working to determine the future impact these technologies may have. Sorry, lost my train of thought. 
Stakeholders globally, including this committee and the task force, of course, are aware of and working to address these main challenges. For instance, there is a recognition from all stakeholders that they must find ways to mitigate bias, inequity, and other potential harms in automated decision-making systems. As AI is constantly evolving and improving, so too are the tools to address the challenges around explainability, bias, and fairness. We believe technology, along with further research, can help address some of the fairness and interpretability challenges that result from the use of these systems. It is our belief the most effective way for the New York City to maximize its use of automated decision making is to collaborate across the public and private sectors to explore solutions to address these challenges. As leaders in the AI field, our members recognize their important role in making sure this technology is built and applied for the benefit of everyone. While we are supportive of New York City's focus on embedding transparency and oversight in the use of ADS and artificial intelligence, we remain concerned by the lack of public engagement by the task force thus far and the lack of balance in task force representation across the private and public sector. We strongly urge the task force and this committee to promote sustained engagement across public and private stakeholder groups as they explore the solutions to challenges presented by these technologies. This includes, but is not limited to the upcoming public forums that have now been scheduled. In the European Union, the Artificial Intelligence High-Level Expert Group is composed of 52 experts from academia, industry, and civil society, and it helps to guide and support the implementation of the European strategy on artificial intelligence through recommendations on societal, ethical, and legal issues as it relates to AI. This group further interacts with the European AI Alliance to help gather additional feedback from outside stakeholders. We strongly urge the task force to promote a similar multi-stakeholder engagement approach in their efforts. ITI and our member companies stand ready to partner with New York City, the task force, this committee, and the city council in promoting further transparency and oversight in automated decision making. To close, the technology sector supports the work of the task force to advance the benefits and responsible use of automated decision making. We are at the early stages of the commercialization of AI and think it is imperative that society, governments, and the technology sector work together to begin to solve some of the most complex issues. Anytime you are driving innovation that is transforma transformative, there are going to be points of tension, and we understand the concerns that are being raised. We look forward to collaborating with the task force, this committee, and the general public on the exciting road ahead. I'm happy to answer any questions at the appropriate time, and thank you for the opportunity to share our perspectives. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. So let me ask you a question on both of you. Well, what, le what relevant technical information of ADS, in your opinion, should the task force uh, reveal? The source code, models, the training data? I would say that we should protect source code and proprietary algorithms and intellectual property. And I'd say that, relevant to your question, it would need to be context-based and risk-specific. Uh, my fundamental concern is being able to hold any one of these algorithmic decision-making as accountable as the person who's authored the algorithm. And so, um, uh, I, regardless if it's a proprietary algorithm, it's, if it's being used within public decision-making process, and my life and the people's lives are being affected by it through the lens of government, that algorithm needs to be accountable. And there needs to be methods, whatever they are conceived of, to be able to hold that algorithm accountable. And I think that that's the goal of the task force. Um, I've seen that the task force has talked about different types of scorecards. Uh, the gentleman from STOP um, uh, mentioned some type of like, um, almost like the way to equate it would be a um, food inspection review, mm -hmm. you know, or a uh, um, something that you see as a dietary label of all of the ingredients and what is it, uh, what is it, what does it do? I think that is the direction uh, that I want to see any algorithm that's adopted by government have on it to bring transparency in regards to what these decision making, these digital decision makings are, are processing. Um, uh, I mean, I guess I'll just kind of re-ask the two that I asked of the prior panel. One, about this sort of definitional question, how do we think about where the lines are of what is automated decision making and what is use of data um, of the sort that might not be. And then two, 
what thoughts do you have about how to, you know, w what kinds of procedures we would want to come out of this to make sure we're achieving compliance? Um, uh, I, once again, the gentleman from STOP, I think, um, made it clear in regards to your bill uh, around drivers. Um, there's a lot of inputs that go into who gets ticketed or cited through just the camera, right? Like the camera has to be placed in a school. Where is the school located? Have we been biased in regards to where schools are built uh, across the city? Um, you know, um, so there, there are a lot of inputs into any one single uh, automated decision making practice and that is where we need transparency. We fundamentally need to understand how to hold these systems, how can we hold these systems accountable and really understand what is um, uh, its inf like foundation, what, what are the parts that are within that foundation, what are the structural materials uh, that uh, ensure that that foundation of that algorithm um, uh, is able, like we're able to pull apart that algorithm in a way that we can really understand how that decision is being made. Um, there will always be a bias in these different systems. This is what Janet has I expressed in her testimony, that there is a whole academic field of understanding how these biases are expressed. Um, we are all biased. Our technology fundamentally becomes biased uh, because we are humans and we are biased. And I hope that this task force can essentially provide a framework that enables us to explore that bias and make that bias as transparent as possible, uh, particularly when it comes to algorithms within government. If I could just add um, one thing, I think as you noted, there is inherent bias in everything we do with people and as it would make sense our systems as well, but there have been instances in which artificial intelligence has uncovered bias that was undetectable previously to humans. So I think our concern is recognizing primarily that art artificial intelligence and automated decision systems aren't inherently bad, but recognizing how to put up the guide, the guideposts of sorts and the frameworks for when they are impacting constituents and citizens, especially in critical areas like healthcare and others. Thank you. Thank you. We have the last panel, uh, Mr. Salon. Salon, Bible class. Uh, before you start, are there anyone else who want to testify? Yeah. If you want to, please fill out a paper at the sergeant of arms. Last call. Yeah. Yeah. You may uh, identify yourself and start. Yeah. that is now so on. Is on? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I'll just start again. So hi, I'm Solon Brokus. I'm a researcher at Microsoft Research here in New York City. I'm also a professor of information science at Cornell University. I'm here to offer joint testimony with my colleague and fellow task force member, Julia Trojanovic. Uh, she is an assistant professor of computer science at NYU um, and is a professor of data science also at NYU. Um, we've submitted joint testimony, and I'll read from that testimony now. Um, so in this testimony, we would like to express our concerns with the direction of the work of the ADS task force. The intent of Law 49 of 2018 is to uphold two important principles in the use of ADS and city agencies to enable greater government transparency and accountability and to ensure fairness and equity. Yet the work of the task force so far has failed to fully satisfy these principles. Despite numerous requests, task force members have not been given any information about ADSs used by the city. To date, the city has not identified even a single system. Task force members need to know about relevant systems used by the city to provide meaningful recommendations. A report based on hypothetical examples rather than on actual NYC systems will remain abstract and inapplicable in practice. The task force cannot issue actionable and credible recommendations without some knowledge of the systems to which they are intended to apply. 
The need for examples has been raised by several of us on numerous occasions, but remained unaddressed until yesterday, just one day before this hearing, with the city suggesting that two examples might be forthcoming at some unspecified future date. The city has cited concerns with privacy and security in response to our requests, but these cannot be used as blanket reasons to stand in the way of government transparency. Privacy and security considerations must be thoughtfully addressed as part of the process of formulating recommendations for transparency and accountability. However, we can only determine how to navigate these tensions if basic details about actual ADSs and specific concerns that justifiably counsel against transparency are shared with the task force. These cannot be negotiated in the abstract. Despite these challenges, the task force was able to make some meaningful progress in developing a methodology for eliciting relevant information about ADSs using so-called ADS cards that ask developers and operators to provide specific details about the system in question, and we have submitted as part of this testimony an example of such a card. ADS cards built on an emerging body of academic research on transparency and accountability for automated decisions, and we viewed them as a worthwhile and promising effort. Unfortunately, the city had the task force abandon ADS cards at the start of the year for reasons that remain unclear. The problems I've described are exacerbated by the lack of transparency in the city's decision making about the task force structure and operation. Not only do task force members lack the information about ADSs that they need to execute the mandate of the law, but they lack information as to how and why these decisions are made. In light of these concerns, we are making the following recommendations. We suggest that the city council urge the city itself to provide task force members with sufficient information and examples to develop well-informed, concrete, and actionable recommendations. Should the city fail to be forthcoming, the city council should amend the law to give task force members legal authority to make such requests. Two, if it's determined that additional time is needed to collect, to identify and collect information about ADSs, the city council should amend the law to allocate additional time to the work of the task force. It is important to do this work right rather than do it quickly. Finally, the city council should play a more active and consistent role in overseeing ta the task force with the goal of ensuring that the city works with task force members to fulfill the mandate of the law. The apparent lack of commitment to transparency on the part of the task force leadership casts doubt on the city's intentions to seriously consider or enact the, re the report's recommendations, recommendations largely about transparency. We hope that the city council will take deliberate and decisive action to address the concerns we raise in our testimony. Otherwise, we worry that this highly visible, much anticipated effort, the first such effort in the United States, will be a missed opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, taking the time to come here to testify. Uh, we will uh, review your recommendations. Uh, in your testimony, you have mentioned ADS cards. Uh, which are attached to your testimony. Why do you focus on Indiana and Allegheny, but not on New York? We focus on this example because this is one of few known examples of a jurisdiction um, having a process that was actually made quite public in the development of some such tool. Um, it was the subject of a New York Times article and later one of the examples of an academic researcher who investigated such systems. Um, in the absence of having examples from the United States, from, from New York rather, uh, we were forced to use examples from elsewhere, known examples from elsewhere. What can be done to ensure that uh, we have the information we need? At a minimum, it would be very helpful to have uh, even basic information about relevant uh, systems. Um, and I understand the challenge here about settling on a definition and, and uh, the challenge of figuring out the scope. Um, but the lack of any examples at all, or even identifying not specific details, but the ex mere existence of relevant systems has really impeded any meaningful conversation about these kinds of uh, systems. Yeah, we will keep in touch, and I really appreciate you coming here to testify. Thank, Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, is there any more public participation? Uh, seeing none, this meeting will be adjourned. It's adjourned.